Hey everyone, if you love listening to Curbsiders and want to enhance the experience, then now is a great time to join the Curbsiders Patreon with new annual memberships where you can save 10% off the monthly rate. You'll have the option to hear all the episodes ad-free plus twice monthly bonus episodes. You can sign up at patreon.com slash curbsiders. This is a great way to use that CME money that's probably burning a hole in your pocket. Plus support the show so we can keep bringing you clinical pearls, practice changing knowledge, mini series like teach and addiction medicine, our digest newsletter, and of course expand our video content. So join the Cashlack family today at patreon.com slash curbsiders. The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto, here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Uh, Paul, how are you doing? How are you feeling? <laughs> We've been traveling for three weeks together right now. I'm real tired, dude. How are you? I am, uh, you know, I, I have some energy. I have a cup of coffee in me, so I'm, I'm okay. You're doing great. We yeah. just had a great discussion with our guest, Dr. Kim Gajuni, and uh, talking about obesity medicine, a lot of counseling around it, uh, some medication stuff. We really went all over. Nice compliment to some of the other obesity medicine shows that we've talked about. Uh, Paul, before I tell them a little more about our guests, can you tell me uh, what is it that we do on this show or remind the audience what is it that we do on this show? Sure. Hey, audience. A reminder, we are at the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. Matt, as you mentioned, we talked to Dr. Kim Gajuni. Why don't I let you tell us all about her? That's right. So, we had uh, Dr. Kim Gajuni on the show. She, Kim Gajuni, MD, MPH, FTOS. She is an internal medicine and obesity medicine physician. She is medical director of the American Board of Obesity Medicine and an associate professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins. She founded and directs the Johns Hopkins Healthful Eating Activity and Weight Program. Her research focuses on how obesity influences the healthcare experience and contributes to health disparities, as well as the efficacy of weight management interventions. Uh, a reminder that this and most episodes are available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. And without further ado, let's get to the episode. Kim, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we've been back and forth emailing. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your busy conference to talk to us about this. Now, before we start talking about obesity medicine, I wanted to just ask you our standard question, which is tell the audience, so they've heard your formal bio already, but tell them like a hobby or interest that you have outside of medicine. Yeah, so these days, really, my hobby is sort of pretending to be on HGTV. Uh, <laughs> my, my husband and I bought a fixer-upper uh, during the pandemic, uh, and uh, the term deferred maintenance, I, I wasn't really familiar with the term <laughs> until we purchased the house. Uh, but as a result, uh, there's been a lot of painting and spackling and electrical work. So um, I'm much handier now than ever before. That's good. So, yeah, that's my my pastime these days. Uh, HGTV. <laughs> It, yeah. So I'm moving into a new place and the landlord seems amazing. We'll see. Well, I'll keep the everyone updated. Um, <laughs> but the, the bathroom tile in one of the bathrooms is interesting um, and we'll just leave it at that. And when I was sort of touring the place with, with the landlord, they're like, it was COVID. It was, you know, it, was, it was just like <laughs> we were trying some things. I was in a different headspace. I'm sorry. And I was like, okay, that's that's fair enough. Um, so the, the COVID renovations, I guess, is the point that I'm making seem to be a, a common thing. Yeah, we, we uh, my husband might have uh, torn up uh, three or four layers of tile on our basement, uh, or not basement, bathroom floor, uh, just uh, from the 1960s, sort of oh. continuing layer yeah. after layer after layer. Uh, it was, was sort of a blast to the past yeah. of, oh, yeah, I remember when that was popular. <laughs> it's like a fun archaeologic project. That's exactly, nice. exactly. It probably feels like you have higher ceilings now that you took several <laughs> exactly. layers out. Okay. <laughs> Um, another favorite question we like to ask, tell us if you don't mind about your favorite failure and, and what you learned from it. Yeah. So I think the, one of the most interesting failures, uh, personally was actually deciding to rent a car in Rome. Uh, so I was traveling with my dad. We decided, oh, let's take a 
trip to Italy, and he was adamant we have to rent a car in Rome, which uh, led to a lot of getting lost, <laughs> um, a lot of driving around the same loop over and over again, a lot of angry Italians um, <laughs> yelling at us, uh, but really sort of came to the appreciation of not knowing where you're going is sometimes leads to the most fun and the most adventure. Uh, and it's a time, even though in the moment I might have been insanely frustrated <laughs> with both myself and yeah. with him, uh, we still think back to that trip and the getting lost and all of the adventures that came with that. Um, so ultimately a huge failure. Don't recommend, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, driving on the other side of the road, uh, it, it, the, yeah, that to me, that would be a little anxiety provoking as well. I like to either walk, run, or like bike around a new, that, that's another good way to get lost in a city. And, uh, if you're touring a new city, so the car thing is. Yeah. That adds an extra dimension of sort of fear and death. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> kind of locks in the memory. Exactly. Life. It's good. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Paul. Well, we have a lot to get to. So why don't you get, bring us a case from Cashlack and, and let's get started talking about obesity medicine. Sure. Happy to. So we're going to talk about Ms. J. She is a 42-year-old female with class 1 obesity with the BMI of 31, fatty liver disease, prehypertension, prediabetes, all the pre's, coming to our primary care office uh, as a new patient and asking for help with weight loss. Uh, Ms. J has struggled with cycles of weight gain and loss since her early 20s. She's tried multiple different diets, including paleo, keto, intermittent fasting, juicing, and weight watchers. Um, she exercises for 30 to 60 minutes, five days per week, and she doesn't seem to lose weight that way. She's been trying to do a good job of eating fruits and vegetables. She's trying to limit uh, sweet desserts. And importantly, she does not drink sugar-sweetened beverages, which is like my first line of attack. And without that, I don't even know where to go from here. So... <laughs> Thankfully, we have you here to help guide us through the process. But before we even get to sort of the directive stuff, if maybe you could sort of talk us through what barriers a primary care doctor might even perceive when having a conversation about obesity and weight loss in a primary care office. Yeah, so I think one of uh, the main barriers oftentimes stems from our own lack of education. You know, I think back to when I was a medical student, when I was a resident, I really didn't learn much about obesity and how to treat it. Yet it's a problem that affects the majority of our patients. And I think there was really a, a tide that turned in 2012 when obesity was stated as a chronic disease and thinking about, actually, this should be something that we treat, but then what do we do? And so I think there's a lot of evidence out there showing that, you know, primary care physicians don't really know where to start. That lack of training, you know, medicine is still very much an apprenticeship. And so it just is such an overwhelming body of information to try to synthesize and then distill and provide advice to a patient. Um, I think one of the other things is that we are a lot of our training is focused more on, you know, treating or managing the prediabetes or the prehypertension that we know what to do with that. And sometimes those seem a little bit on in our wheelhouse, but also sometimes more of a priority. We're sometimes thinking about, you know, can we get to the root cause of something, but knowing oftentimes the intensivity that re is required for the treatment of obesity, it just seems really overwhelming of where do I start? And so I think it's sometimes just picking a place to start with folks is sometimes the most important first step. Yeah, I think the the paper that that you referenced in your talk was by, was it Ashman? And it was in PLO. Yeah, PLOS 2023. And they were talking about, I think some people just, th there were all sorts of reasons that people weren't doing it. And it was like, well, I didn't think the patient was interested uh, or I didn't think I knew what to do. And I was like, those are those are reasons that we should teach ourselves what to do. So that's part of why we're doing this podcast. So our primary care audience can get some tips from you. And then you should ask the patient if they <laughs> if they're yeah. interested. Well, I think that there's, there's an interesting situation where when we ask uh, providers. They're oftentimes waiting for the patient to say something that mm -hmm. I think the awareness of weight bias and stigma has really come to the forefront. At the same time, so there's a, a dancing around that we don't want to bring up the, yeah. in, the issue in, for fear of actually alienating someone. At the same time, sometimes patients are waiting for the physician to bring it up to say, hey, it's actually okay to discuss this. And so I think it's really thinking about how do we begin that conversation. And so I oftentimes like to think about it of, of asking permission, mm -hmm. of saying, you know, 
is it okay if we talk about your weight? Is that something mm-hmm. you even want to talk about? And giving the power to the patient to say yes or no. And if they say no, that's okay. You know, you can circle back around to it. I think that's the luxury of having a, mm-hmm. a long-term relationship with patients. Um, but if they are interested, that that opens that doorway for having that initial mm-hmm. conversation, which I think is really important. I don't know, have you ever had someone say no when you ask permission to talk about their weight? I, I mm-hmm. can't remember a person yet. Usually they're the, receptive. I think that they may not want to address it necessarily, or it may not be a primary concern, but I think that they a lot of the times expect it. I think it's... Yeah, I think people would hope that you yeah. at least bring it up. If not, you know, maybe that's the, that might not be the target to go after that visit. Any other barriers that you thought were important that you wanted to point out to the audience and maybe we can give them ways around them other than educating themselves, which we're, we're doing by listening to this podcast? But So I think uh, some of the things that were brought up in the paper uh, related to uh, issues with reimbursement, um, which that is actually a changing landscape. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that we're holding on a little bit to these notions that you can't use a diagnosis code of obesity on a visit, which that's becoming less and less of a, of a case. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think by not using that as a diagnosis code, it sometimes handicaps if we're thinking about employers looking at, well, what is their population of employees and what benefits do they need to provide? If we're not coding for things like obesity, they're using claims data to try to identify that. They can't actually even see that as a need. Mm. And so thinking about our own practices and how we can provide good data for things like insurance coverage of benefits, I think is really important in this area and oftentimes something that we might not necessarily think about. Yeah. And we gave this, this patient has class one obesity and we talked with Dr. Cody Stanford a while back and she was telling us, you know, drop the term morbid obesity uh, class one obesity, class two, it kind of sort of sounds like you're talking about it in the chronic disease model. And um, I think people should be coding that and uh, addressing it. I think the other thing is thinking about uh, sometimes there's a a challenge when patients now can see their own notes and see their diagnosis yeah. codes of when they get assigned a diagnosis that was never explained to them, mm. um, which I think creates a lot of tension there for folks. And so I do think before assigning a diagnosis into a chart, sometimes explaining to patients that this is a medical chronic condition, that we're, this is why I'm using this. And it's not a assignment or a label of shame or blame. Mm -hmm. It's just, this is a chronic medical condition and sort of normalizing that I think is important. And I agree with Dr. Cody Sandford of avoiding sort of the morbidly obese term, mm-hmm. but we now have all of these great, you know, ICD-10 codes that don't sort of pigeonhole us into that one term. If anything, they're too weirdly specific. I don't know, the electronic health record that I use, like the first one is like due to a medication that is not like, it's like it, the diagnosis code is yeah, like three lines yeah. long. I'm like, well, no, no, I don't just. <laughs> right. Uh, you shouldn't have to scroll for the most common, uh, one yes. more common chronic disease issues. And... <laughs> yeah, let's complain about electronic health records. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I Can I just select one diagnosis and not have to put like 25 modifiers on this it? Is, um, I think people are going to love this episode. Yes. This is gonna go uh, right <laughs> <laughs> so, Kim, um, th- we gave you a tough, this is a tough case for me. Uh, when you see somebody that is doing a lot of, has tried a lot of things, is doing a lot of things, this person's like really active and still struggling with their weight. So what might be your spiel like, how might you talk to uh, Miss J at that first visit to just sort of like let her know what's coming uh, as you work together on her weight? Yeah, so I spend a lot of time talking about what is actually the physiology of weight regulation. Mm-hmm. So I think we have a lot of misconceptions that it's just eat less, move more. Mm-hmm. And for the vast majority of people, that's actually not the case for them, mm-hmm. um, that folks like Ms. J can be successful in using a dietary strategy for a period of time, but then ultimately our body sometimes works against us. Yeah. Um, and all of the hormonal regulation that comes into play in thinking about getting back to sort of that set point where you were before. Mm-hmm. And so both, I think, physicians and patients don't really understand this concept that we have so much media out there that's really telling us that I should be able to do this, that it's just I stick to this and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm of a lower body weight, which is really not the reality. Um, And so I think it's 
uh, sometimes diving in and understanding some of the eating habits, eating behaviors, um, drivers around what was working well, what happened when things started not going so well. Oftentimes factors like some type of life stressor may be going on, emotional eating, and diving into those eating habits, perceptions mm -hmm. of hunger, which can then help lead to clues on where should we go actually treatment-wise. Mm -hmm. um, and so her story is actually very common with, with the patients that I see in my own practice. And I think it's sometimes setting a new paradigm for folks that this is not just, you know, I do keto for three months to lose weight yeah. and then I go back, that this is really a lifelong change, um, not only for lifestyle, but then thinking about, you know, the role of things like pharmacotherapy mm -hmm. in actual um, weight management. Yeah, we talked about, this is years ago now, Paul, I think it was like one of our first, you know, 50 episodes we talked with um, about obesity, how the, about the set point issue, I, I sort of feel like the metabolic surgery and the, the newer weight loss drugs are maybe addressing it a little bit, but is it, is it true? Is it fair to say that if let's say her weight was 250 pounds or something like that, and her body anchors to that weight and says, if, if I lose, if I deviate from that weight, it's going to slow her metabolism and increase hunger to try to get back to it. Exactly. Is that the, sign, the exactly. gist of it? That as you lose, um, that you can hold for a period of time. Right. But then you're going to get triggers of slowly increasing appetite um, and not feeling satiated on what you once were. Yeah. You combine that with the fact that as you lose weight, um, your metabolic rate is negatively impacted. And so you actually need to maintain a lower caloric balance. Yeah. And so when people try to go back to their normal, that then you're just going to go right yeah. back to where you were. And a lot of folks will tell you, I actually went beyond where I was at that point in time. Mm. And so it's really thinking about with surgery, with the medications of trying to get you lower, but then hold is mm -hmm. really the goal. And that, you know, you can't, as much as we would like to willpower against our physiology, yeah. that's that's not the way that your body works. And so we need to think about, you know, how do we use tools to sort of augment and support someone right. on their journey? I feel like there's two messages that get mixed up. And Paul knows that I get I get on this a lot, but the I think if you if we can prevent preventing patients from attaining a, a weight of 250. So their set point is 180 instead of 250. You know, that's that should be one goal. But we have a huge amount of people in the country that are already at a, a, a higher set point. And those patients, like, we can't just tell them to just gut it out. You exactly. Know, it's we're, just, we're really setting people up oftentimes for failure. Yeah. And there's so much – obesity is an interesting condition in the fact that not only are people feeling bias and stigma from outside, but there's also a very strong internalized weight bias. And so an individual with obesity is much more likely to blame themselves and feel like this is their own yeah. failure, where it's not your failure. It, it, it's the fact that your body is, is doing what it's supposed to do. And so right. we need to help people disentangle that. Um, and really understand what is the role for the different treatments and why. And I, I do yeah. agree with you. I think there's two very different populations of those who were wanting to prevent weight gain to avoid getting to this, which is a totally different paradigm yeah. for once you have developed obesity, it's never going to be the same. Yeah. Well, I think making sure that you're addressing the metabolic endpoints too, like rather than sort of focusing on absolute numbers as well. Like this is a patient with prehypertension and prediabetes and and fatty liver disease, all things that can eventually progress and cause, you know, bad cardiovascular outcomes. So I think framing it in that way as opposed to an absolute number and so which feels anchored to some other, like, yeah, I think it's, the stigma is often tied into that, like the number itself specifically um, can be helpful in the conversation. I think the other factors I like to focus in on is for a lot of patients, the idea of sort of cardiometabolic health and risk factors is so abstract. Yeah. It's like, well, I don't have hypertension. <laughs> right. I don't have diabetes yeah. yet. Why are you getting on me? Where I think sometimes bringing in the um, 
uh, more functional limitations and psychological impacts and thinking about how obesity affects not only the cardiometabolic health risk factors, but those dimensions as well, where sometimes it's, you know, being able to go and play with my grandkids, mm -hmm. that that is a bigger personal motivator. And it's then something that the patient can really, it's a very clear point where when you can do that, where you haven't been able to before, that's a clear goal. It's a major accomplishment and a win where I think sometimes seeing your A1C normalize <laughs> It's a very special person. Sometimes. Congratulations. <laughs> you might not have a stroke in 20 years. You're welcome. Yeah. Um, and so I think balancing the whole constellation um, is really important in understanding what's identify or what's motivating that one person. It's really mm -hmm. important. I I guess we're going to jump around a little bit here, but uh, yeah, I was hoping you're going to bring this up. Uh, uh, well, actually, no, I, I I don't think I'm going where you think. So what were you going to ask? <laughs> well, I was going to ask about the paper that you you had in, in our outline specifically about motivational interviewing. So which is not, oh, yeah. okay. which I am a tremendous fan of. Obviously, I'm a primary care doctor. I think it's it has a lot of uses. But I guess there's one paper that sort of looked at motivational interviewing specifically um, in weight loss and found it sort of less efficacious um, or not efficacious, I guess, if I'm being very specific. Like, as, I guess, I'm not sure there's even a question here. I guess, how do you reconcile those two things, I guess, might be the question. Sure. So that systematic review was looking at motivational interviewing in the context of a behavioral weight loss program. So I think that's an important nuance to sort of realize. And I think that motivational interviewing within the context of obesity treatment and programs has been a little bit controversial. There are some that have been like, we must do MI and others being like, well, do we really need to do MI? Um, and really what this review in consolidating all the RCTs is suggesting is that MI is not necessarily better than a similar intensity program. Uh, and so I think that that gives us latitude um, to think about when should MI actually be used. I think MI is a good tool, particularly for primary care um, providers when you're one-on-one -on -one with a patient mm -hmm. and the patient has a lot of ambivalence towards change, where I think it's a great tool to use things like a uh, a one through 10 ruler of, you know, how do you go from, you know, what is your motivation to make changes in diet? You know, oh, I am a three. Well, why aren't you a two? Uh, and then working towards, okay, well, what would get you to a five? Yeah. I think that that's a very helpful tool. I think though in the context of a behavioral weight loss program, a lot of times people who are coming into those programs have already resolved their ambivalence. Yeah. And so I think it's Interesting. In thinking about the right tool at the right time with the right patient, I think MI is really helpful with that, where sometimes the intensivity is a more important factor in a behavioral weight loss program. So if you are being seen once a week, every other week, it's that contact, that problem solving, that shared decision making. And so you don't necessarily need MI. It's not harmful. You can definitely use it, but it's it's not the be all and end all that I think sometimes has been sort of promoted out there. Right. Yeah. I guess that's the broader point. Like motivational interviewing, I think is a very specific technique, whereas I will never think it's the wrong thing to incorporate a patient's own motivations and barriers into their care. Like that's just, that's how you take care of patients. So the paper I, I was, yeah. And so I, I, I don't think it's going to change my practice necessarily, but I was, I'm, that's a very helpful comment. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think something that we've talked about on this show, which is probably just the error that we've trained and come up as physicians in, is that generally it works better if you're partnering with the patient, not just like, <laughs> you know, telling them what to do. I, I But I, 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 I love the point that patients coming to your clinic, they're coming like motivated to lose weight. Yes. So how much more can you add to that? But if it's, if it's the person you're like, hey, your A1C is nine, you have high blood pressure, and they're like, yeah, whatever. I, I'm not really ready to make changes. But then you, the, the stuff you talked about, what about playing with your kids or your grandkids, like, you know, trying to find some sort of way in to get them to start working with you? It seems yeah. like that would work better. Well, and I, I oftentimes, I really love the longitudinality of the relationship because I yeah. think it's something where setting the expectation that even if they're not ready to talk about it or make a plan now, letting them know that you're going to bring it up again, where I think sometimes, given that this is a topic that a lot of people feel uncomfortable with, it mm -hmm. might be during like the annual 
physical exam. And that's the one time when the patient knows that this is going to be brought up. Yeah. Where I think adding that in, if you are seeing them more than once a year, yeah. to say, hey, just want to check in on your weight, just to sort of have that reminder and keeping that door open for that conversation, I think can be really helpful because we have to be a little careful sometimes the messages that we give sometimes unintentionally by not bringing things up mm -hmm. again. Um, and while just always having that door open. So when someone is, you know, activated and ready and wanting to have that discussion, they know that they can turn to you, I think is really important because if they feel like they can't, then they're going to go elsewhere. There's, there's so much in the commercial marketplace yeah. around weight loss and making sure that they're really picking the best option for them. That's evidence-based. You know, you're really the guide there. Mm -hmm. Great. I, I do the same thing with tobacco cessation, whatever it's worth to like, it's you, you, maybe you can't spend the 15 minutes every single visit, but I'm like, I haven't forgotten about it. We're going to talk about it next time. It's still important to me, but you know, this is <laughs> not the focus. I think the around. other thing that I like to do is, um, for folks where but sometimes, you know, you only have 15, 20 minutes mm -hmm. if you're lucky. And that this sometimes takes a little bit of time to begin delving into some of these things of saying, setting an, an agenda that, you know, I'd actually like you to come back in a month or two months just to specifically talk about this, which really emphasizes that priority, right. um, that this is not only important to them, it's important to you. Um, and I think it's 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 hard to tack it on, you know. It is. And and then that's I think sometimes when we result into the, oh, you know, just start tracking your calories or oh, just do this, which then doesn't sort of leave the right impression sometimes mm -hmm. with patients. And so that intentionality I think is is helpful if that's possible within folks's um, you know, practice panels and things like that. And we're talking about contact with the patient and follow up. Telemedicine was another thing that you talked about. Uh, this was by Kahane, and it was in Obesity in 2022, the journal Obesity. Uh, w tell us about like long-term weight management using telemedicine. Is that a valid thing? Does it work? Does it help? Yeah. So telemedicine really has, I think, revolutionized obesity medicine mm -hmm. um, in that it's not that we don't ever need to see patients in person, but really what we know is that the frequency of contact is really, really important. But it's really hard to ask a patient every single month or every two weeks to physically come in. People have jobs, they have yeah. lives, they yeah. have things to do. Um, and so telemedicine really allows um, an increase in accessibility uh, to a provider and whether that be you know, a dietitian or a psychologist or a physician or what have you, that we've learned that we don't actually need to see people in person, mm -hmm. um, that most of what we do is counseling and shared decision making. Um, and that can be very effective over a telemedicine platform. And then looking at outcomes um, with telemedicine during the pandemic, people are actually engaging in more visits um, than they were um, previous when we were requiring people or mm -hmm. our only option was in person at that time. And we don't really see differences in use of medications and outcomes as far as weight loss. And so in trying to increase accessibility, um, you know, I think that this is really sort of the path forward. Um, and if that can be incorporated, you know, not just in obesity medicine, but I think primary care more broadly, who's working in mm -hmm. this space, I think it's a really useful tool. What would Miss J uh, expect? Like, what you mentioned some team, potential team members in that response there. If she were to see you in your clinic, if you wanted to talk about uh, what it's called and who's part of the team there, and then we can talk about how we might be able to do some of that in our primary care offices. We're probably definitely not going to have all the resources, but I want to sure. hear what you have. Yeah. Uh, so I've been practicing obesity medicine for almost 15 years now. Um, and back in 2020, uh, we worked to expand the obesity medicine uh, offering uh, called the Healthful Eating Activity and Weight Program. And really thinking about having a space where um, providers from different disciplines can come together and provide collaborative care for patients. 
Um, so we have now eight obesity medicine physicians wow. in the practice, uh, along with two hepatologists who focus on um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, um, an endocrinologist, um, two of our bariatric surgeons practice with us. Um, we have um, psychologists um, that are affiliated with the practice, um, as well as um, a health coach. We do group visits, um, and mm-hmm. our health coach is really key with that. Uh, and then we work closely with um, our dietitians. We launched this in 2020, so m- middle of COVID. Um, Great time so to launch anything. Yeah, it was perfect. Um, and so we have a lot of close dietitian colleagues that we work with. They're not currently embedded with us, mm-hmm. um, but I because we're all um, obesity medicine physicians, we actually have a lot of training in nutrition, and so do a lot of yeah. that ourselves, and rely upon our dietitians for very advanced cases. Um, and thinking about sort of a, a cost conscious model for care, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of folks don't have insurance coverage to see a dietitian, um, and so we sort of balance that of um, making sure the people get in who need to, um, but then handling a lot of the nutritional counseling ourselves uh, in order to try to create a most cost efficient care. Yeah, we we talked with Dr. Michelle McMacken uh, about she she has like a superfoods handout that she shared with us to give to patients. But do you have uh, handouts or websites or things that are free or low cost that we can recommend to the audience that, you know, to steer people towards? Yeah. So um, I think that there's uh, some good uh, references online through things like um, USDA as far as um, nutritional resources. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some good uh, recipes and meal planning websites mm-hmm. out there. Um, eatingwell.com is a really nice one that provides all the nutritional information mm-hmm. for folks. Um, and so we use uh, those tools quite frequently. Um, we're also a big fan of thinking about um, tracking apps. So I don't have necessarily this is my only tracking app that I use. Um, But in thinking about um, what is really the point of tracking um, is really important. And it's more the accountability and mindfulness rather than the precision around exactly what you're doing and what you're getting in. Um, And so we use that as a tool in all of this rather than uh, quite so dogmatic about you must get exactly this balance yeah which never works out anyway yeah and the the estimates aren't that accurate anyway and so sometimes reframing that for folks so uh, tracking steps calories sleep um what else i i, I physical guess activity. physical activity mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's yeah. great that's great okay Paul, any other questions about this part of it? I mean, I I think health coach is probably hard to come by for most, most people. Uh, and probably have, I'd probably have in my practice, I'm having generally refer to a dietitian, um, or a psychologist. And I, I think the psychologists seem to be hard to come by. Are these psychologists specifically trained in, um, like food addiction or, or or eating related behaviors. I'm not sure what the right term would be. Yeah. So the psychologists that we work with do have specific training in uh, conditions like binge eating disorder, Mm -hmm. night eating syndrome. Um, I actually think out of all of the potential ancillary (laughs) other staff, Mm -hmm. um, having a psychologist in your area that you can identify to work with, I actually think is the most key. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of times I feel like with nutrition, I sometimes advocate, you don't need to know every single nutritional strategy out there, but if you get familiar with three of them, usually that will help most patients. (laughs) So oftentimes sort of a, a tracking situation something like either Mediterranean or a DASH diet, Mm -hmm. and then feeling comfortable talking about a low-carb approach, Um, that those three will work for the vast majority of people Mm -hmm. um, and get them going um, where they need to be nutritionally. Yeah. Um, But the psychologist, if someone really is having issues with, um, even if it's not sort of diagnostic for an eating disorder. There's a whole gray zone before there um, in relation to emotional eating and that spending a little bit of time doing some cognitive behavioral therapy with a psychologist can make all the difference in the world and thinking about this being a different weight loss experience than they've ever had before. Um, where oftentimes when you dive into, well, what happened? Why did you regain weight? There are these certain triggers that that we need to 
think about what is a contingency plan. And that's where really working with a psychologist to have that plan in place, which is really hard <laughs> to do yeah. as a physician. We're just not really yeah. trained in that. Um, and not all psychologists are as well. And so trying to find one that you can kind of partner with so that if you do have a patient that seems like is potentially in this zone to have a different experience because some of the things we do like tracking in someone who actually has an eating disorder that would actually be contraindicated. We wouldn't want sure. someone to track that it's actually potentially harmful. And so having, there's a few brief um, screeners, um, one called the SCOF, um, which is five questions. Um, and that if you score a certain score, that that would be sort of a flag of, hey, this person should probably be evaluated by a psychologist um, or a counselor or social worker before really diving into sort of a weight management plan. Her initial question is, you know, would you say that you have a complicated relationship with food? I think is like her initial screening <laughs> question, which is like, <laughs> you know, like, ooh. And like, and I think that is a, a conversation started me. And like, if someone can just say, nah, then like, I, I think I'm done here. But if they say yes, then that might be a, a sort of a trigger to kind of pursue and sort of investigate yeah. a little bit more, more completely. In, in my experience, most patients don't just say like, I, I binge eat or I have like, it's not it. Uh, I've had maybe one person I can remember that came to me with that concern, but usually you have to specifically ask about it. Well, there's so much shame and guilt around all yeah. of these behaviors. And so people don't want to come out and say sure. that. And so sometimes I think having these brief screening tools mm. um, are a way to remove some of that judgment behind there and then get people to sort of the right spot in care that they need. Yeah. Well, okay. So we've talked <laughs> a bunch about Miss. So we're, we're going to bring it back to Miss J a little bit here. Paul, I think we should read the second part of the case and maybe we could talk about some, maybe some of the medication stuff yeah. uh, and other questions we had. All right. Well, let's, let's say we put together at least sort of a, a lifestyle plan for, for Ms. J initially. And she comes to see us in three month follow up via telemedicine because we read the studies and we feel good about things. She's, she's made some tweaks to her diet and her exercise regimen, but her weight loss has plateaued and maybe she's even gained three pounds relatively recently. She's understandably frustrated. Her A1C is 6.2%. Uh, percent. Her blood pressure is routinely in the 120s to 130s, systolic over 80s. Um, and she's, she's heard about these medications on TV. She might be interested in starting a GLP-1 agonist for weight loss. Um, so she's ready for medication therapy and even sort of broached the topic with you. So I, I guess we would like to hear sort of how you initially talk to patients who maybe don't have the success they were hoping for initially, and then we can sort of transition specifically into to medication management. Sure. So uh, I start by normalizing the fact that what she's experienced is not necessarily totally unexpected um, and that just for her, we need to find the right tool um, in order to treat her obesity, uh, to really, again, remove some of that blame, shame, guilt um, that a lot of patients feel with this. Um, and oftentimes that then is followed by uh, a discussion around all of the um, anti-obesity medications that exist. Um, oftentimes when people come in specifically interested in a GLP-1, I take that as an opportunity to actually talk about all of them, because <laughs> um, we do have quite a few now that are FDA approved. Um, and I think it's sometimes, I feel it's important to run through the whole spectrum with folks, yeah. because not everyone responds to a GLP-1. And so sometimes if someone can't tolerate it, or they are in that group that is a non-responder, Again, they start saying, there's something wrong with me, mm. that why can't I do this? And it's like, well, it's, that's just not the right medication for you. We just need to find the right one. And so opening that up to have, it's not you, we just need to find the right fit, I think is really helpful for folks in reconceptualizing yeah. this. Um, so as far as uh, a lot of people are interested in GLP ones right now, given all of the press around that, um, and so oftentimes that's a starting point. I like to hear why they are specifically interested. What do they know about the medications mm -hmm. um, before really sort of launching in? Um, my discussions uh, oftentimes center around the mechanism of action of how do um, each medication work, um, what are the potential side effects, how do we manage them, um, and then 
Unfortunately, since we're in the U.S., um, there's also uh, a conversation around cost um, has to be sort of factored in. And what does this cost if your insurance doesn't cover this mm -hmm. medication? Um, and so that way we can really then go through and have a shared decision making process. Um, and some folks still end up saying, yeah, I'd like to go with the GLP-1. But sometimes they actually choose a different option than yeah. what they initially came in and started with. Yeah, I find that it's unless if they have type two diabetes, it's easy to get them on a GLP one uh, or or terzepatide. But uh, if they don't, then it's a lot of the time it's it's very hard. A lot of prior authorizations back and forth. So I am still using some of the um, you know I guess we can call them older agents now. Uh, now we talked, we we did talk about this on a prior episode. Some of the older agents and there, so bupropion naltrexone comes in a combination. Phentermine topiramate comes in a combination. Uh, there's Orlistat, which I believe is the generic, right? Correct. Uh, yeah, and then lorcasterin is gone, right? Mm -hmm. That that one is some sort of increased cancer risk or something. Mm -hmm. So anything I'm missing there, and do you? How do you quickly go through those with a patient in a visit? I, I pr probably your new first patient visits are an hour or thirty something like that. Or yeah, initial patient visits for me are an hour, okay. um, which is a, a, lu a luxury that I know not everybody has. And so usually during that time, I'll run through all of the medication options with them. Um, and so usually I actually start with um, fentramine just by mm -hmm. itself. Um, okay. So there's a number of um, medications, fentramine, diethylpropion, um, that are still available on the market mm -hmm. that can be used as uh, monotherapy, you know, predominantly work um, by suppressing appetite. Mm -hmm. um, there is some uh, data to suggest that they may increase um, metabolic rate a little bit, although that is a little bit controversial. These have been approved for so long, the, the studies and the quality of the studies are a little little bit different and were originally only FDA approved for short-term use, mm -hmm. um, which is typically considered somewhere around three months. There's a lot of variability, though, from state to state in prescribing practices around fentramine. Uh, and actually, um, the Endocrine Society in 2015 actually put in their guideline statement that fentramine could be considered to be used off-label long-term, um, that there are some mm -hmm. Uh, large cohort studies looking at people taking long-term fentramine for two plus years without increased risk of cardiovascular um, effects yeah. and risks. Um, and thinking about it is in Qsimia, which is approved for long-term use. Mm -hmm. And so that's always a judgment um, by each individual physician from state to state. Um, and then, you know, side effects with this, um, typically dry mouth constipation. Uh, I think one of the things with something like a fentramine is a lot of physicians think about kind of that maximum dose of 37.5 milligrams and starting people there. But there are actually formulations that are lower doses. Yeah. And most people don't actually need 37.5. That over suppresses them where they're not eating anything, which is not the goal. And so kind of starting very low is oftentimes just what folks need. Um, and then, you know, with sort of... Um, uh, fentramine topiramate combination. Um, I think this is really helpful in folks who have um, uh, like a, a sweet tooth or crave carbonated beverages. Um, there is a taste aversion that is listed as a side effect, but a lot of patients actually find it beneficial that they're no longer interested in eating and drinking those things. Is uh, that the topiramate component The topiramate of it? component does that. Um, hmm. And it also creates a little bit more of an early satiety rather than just pure appetite suppression, mm -hmm. which is also uh, a nice feature. Um, and with that, you know, generally well tolerated. I think it's really sort of the birth defects risk. And so always counseling women of reproductive age there. Yeah. And that is really important. I've run into the kidney stone thing with topiramate. So I, and yeah, and after Ruin Y bypass, do you, that was something that came up, uh, I think in some discussion we were having the other day. Do you, do you worry about it in those patients too? If they've had a prior bypass? Not so much. It's, it's more Again, starting low and going slow. Yeah. I think where some of the misconception out there is oftentimes sort of this advocacy of ramping all the way up to max dose mm -hmm. per the titration schedule on the package. Um, and I think this is interestingly being reinforced actually through some of the prior authorization now where if you have a patient who needs to titrate up slower yeah. that then they're coming in and saying, well, why didn't you increase? You need to increase, um, which, you know, doesn't really make a lot of sense. But um, so it's, 
it's used with caution um, okay. and, you know, just each individual patient there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the others, uh, bupropion, naltrexone. Yeah. So um, with that one, I think it's very helpful in people who have a lot of issues with cravings or some of those more emotional eaters um, usually respond well. Mm -hmm. um, again, sort of a lot of the side effects are similar with all of these as far as, um, you know, constipation, dry mouth, uh, headache. Um, and then we have sort of our, our newer agents. Um, and then uh, Orlistat is still available. Uh, I know sometimes uh, not a very popular one, um, but yeah. there are some folks that really do feel a benefit from that. And for folks who have issues with um, elevated cholesterol, you can actually get a cholesterol reduction benefit with that, mm -hmm. which can also be a motivator. I think the one that... Um, uh, you didn't mention it's not technically FDA approved as a medication, but it's actually approved as a device. Um, it's a hydrogel um, that uh, you uh, take three capsules before lunch and dinner. It's kind of like you ate five cucumbers before oh, you eat okay. a meal. Um, and then when you eat, you feel full on smaller portions. Um, so it's a little bit more of a subtle effect there. Um, huh. But the nice part is for folks who have interactions with some of the other medications, that you can use this one. It's kind of like fiber on steroids. Is how you can kind of think about it. Um, and so that can be a nice option for folks who can't really tolerate or have contraindications to the other options. I'll have to look into that one more because that's not one that I am uh, f familiar with. I think maybe it was very briefly mentioned on a previous episode, but I don't even know if that made it to air because it was... Uh, anyway... Um, <laughs> Uh, with with the last few minutes, I did want to just ask, Paul and I have been talking about this a bunch lately, and some of my colleagues have too. You, the sometimes the GLP one agonist or the or the the GIP slash GLP one agonist works so well, the patients are just almost not eating, and the weight is just like coming off, and I'm worried about them almost becoming frail. Is this a concern for you? I mean, what are you monitoring? Tell us how you're monitoring uh, soft tissue or. Uh, lean lean mass uh, when you're when you're monitoring patients or following patients. Yeah, so I think the first thing to realize is that it's it is always normal to lose a little bit of muscle mm -hmm. mass when you lose weight. That will happen regardless. Um, this is usually more of a concern for me in patients um, who are a little bit older, so yeah. 60, 70 plus um, who are needing to lose weight. Um, and in those patients, I really uh, monitor carefully um, body composition. So mm -hmm. in my own clinic, um, I use um, bioelectric impedance analysis to really be able to monitor what is their fat mass, what is their lean mass over the course of weight loss treatment. Uh, and am really very much advocating, particularly for an older population, to make sure that they're incorporating resistance training in early um, so that then we can really work to preserve as much of the muscle mm -hmm. mass as possible. Um, and you can be successful in doing this of actually people on the GLP-1s losing weight and they're predominantly losing fat mass um, and that we can really preserve that muscle mass with monitoring as well as the incorporation of the resistance training. And so it can mm -hmm. be done safely. We just need to be a little bit cautious. You talk about protein as well for like protein intake uh, for those folks too. Yeah. So when someone's appetite is <laughs> so altered, yeah. um, I oftentimes uh, talk with folks to really think about it's even more critical now to think about what you're eating and how you're fueling your body. And so we want to make sure that you have um, adequate lean protein, um, fiber, um, that whatever you're putting in now, because it is a smaller amount, needs to be the best possible stuff that you can put in there. Yeah. And so um, while I might not have people track forever, um, particularly when they're getting into the groove of things, um, ensuring that uh, they are doing a little tracking to see, mm. well, how much protein intake are you actually getting in? Because um, sometimes people will shift what they're eating <laughs> and not make always sort of the best choices and just supporting them mm -hmm. uh, to make the shift so they are doing that in a positive way. Paul, did you have any other questions about the, the GLP-1 agents? No, I mean, the, the lean mass loss is the big one. I think that was addressed thoroughly and thoughtfully. So I think I'm yeah. good. Yeah. And uh, is, is this another one where I, I know that I'm having 
success for weight loss, I mean, not personally, but I mean, for my patients, uh, when I'm using some patients on semaglutide 0 0.25, 0 0.5, I'm, uh, I'm not having to push everybody up to the 2.4, which is the max, the, the largest dose. So can you talk to about the titration a little bit? Yeah. So in my own clinical practice, I think it's really important to titrate to effect mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that uh, the goal actually is not to suppress someone's appetite so much where they're not eating anything. We, we, we need to eat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's, it's, it, I would agree. It is sort of a critical life fun function, you know. Um, Plus, it's fun. It's social. It's, it's all great. I got left. So like <laughs> And so um, really being mindful of taking people to where they need to be, mm -hmm. um, that there are some folks that do need 2.4. There are others, though, that 0.25 is exactly where they need to be. And so it's really just having that follow-up mm -hmm. with folks. I think the other thing is managing the side effects um, with the GLP ones. And so I oftentimes counsel people when they're starting to think about, what your normal portion size is, mm -hmm. and to cut it in half, <laughs> yeah. Um, because that that feeling of um, knowing when to stop that that's a learning curve, and so instead of having people feel miserable for a few weeks when they're trying to figure that out on their own, knowing to cut in half and you'll actually feel satiated on that, right? And that okay, if you're still a little hungry, then have a little bit more, yeah. But that gives people a framework because otherwise. People will come back and say, I'm feeling nauseous constantly. I feel miserable. I can't do this. Well, yeah, it's because you're trying to <laughs> eat what oh, you normally so would. Yeah. And so just to anticipatorily let them know that. The other thing is um, constipation, big oh, issue. That, I, that you, that's a... <laughs> <laughs> I knew where you were going. Yes. And so um, I advocate that when you reduce your portions and thinking about, okay, well, what are you eating? that it really needs to be a lot of fiber in there um, along with the lean protein. Um, and for folks who have a little bit of a difficulty getting in the fiber, I do use like a psyllium-based fiber supplement to help and really to sort of start at the outset, <laughs> um, not until we wait till, oh my gosh, I haven't gone in four days, what do I do yeah. now? Um, to do that from the get-go. Um, and, you know, psyllium-based fiber has lots of other health benefits to it. Um, and so it really sort of works together very nicely. Um, and again, anticipating what people are going to experience before it actually happens, smooths that transition and then increases the tolerability. And then the the more you can stick with it, the better the outcomes will be. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be smoother for my patients, pun intended, Paul. <laughs> Going forward, because I have not been counseling uh, eat half portion sizes. I, th there are a couple patients I was like, this must be a thing because several patients have been like, I was so constipated, I almost went to the ER in, in the first like few months that I was prescribing a lot yeah. more semaglutide. So when I, I tell them, you know, this one of the ways that the medication works is it slows down your digestive system. Yeah. And so understanding that when your stomach is slow and you eat a big meal, Oop, you're going to be nauseous. Mm. Um, and that's why the constipation happens. I think that understanding for folks of why they're experiencing what they're experiencing makes it a little less scary of like, oh my God, what <laughs> is happening to me? Yeah. Um, and so I think that having those really brief conversations to let them know that this is a normal part of the experience, but then also when when it is gone too far of, uh, of Ray and, you know, kind of, what can we do to prevent that from happening? All right. Well, last question is, can you give the audience one or two take-home points if they only remembered one or two things from this talk that you, that you want them to internalize and bring to their practice? Yeah. So I think the first thing would be um, the asking permission um, for, fa for folks to actually talk about this, to, to not be scared, um, to bring this up. I think patients want to talk about it. Um, and then to think about finding some partners um, in your area, um, whether that's, you know, a dietitian, a psychologist, that this is really a team sport, mm -hmm. obesity medicine. And so to really work together and you can really accomplish amazing things for your patients. And so they are running around with their grandkids and their A1C is normal and all of those great things. So it's, it's a really rewarding field to practice in. And I hope that others can really experience that same joy. Oh, fantastic. That's a great, great spot to end on. Thank you. 
This has been another episode of the Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Still hungry for more? Join our Patreon and get all episodes ad-free, plus twice-monthly bonus episodes at patreon.com slash curbsiders. You can find show notes at thecurbsiders.com and sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox, including the Curbsiders Digest, which recaps the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. And we're committed to high-value practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So you can email us at askcurbsiders at gmail.com. You can also find the show on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. A reminder that this and most episodes are available for CME through VCU Health at curbsiders.vcuhealth.org. I wanted to give a special thanks to Chris the Chew Man Chew for uh, helping with the audio video on this episode. Uh, the rest of our technical production is done by the team at Podpaste. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Chris the Chew Man Chew is the moderator on our Discord. And Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And Paul, with all that, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And Matt, as always, I mean Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.